Thanks for joining us today. My name is John. I'm David. And we're here to hear, talk to you about the... Cold carrying. I thought you were going to say handheld penetrometer. Oh, <laughs> no. We're past that. <laughs> we're past that. Okay, so today we're here to talk about hydronic uh, temperature controlling. It's Hydronic Temperature Controlling Shark Week. <laughs> it makes no sense. Well, it's a good talk for today. It's five degrees here in Colorado. It's five degrees and it feels like negative nine with a 17 mile an hour wind. Right. So that's cold. That's cold for here, for sure. And, you know, we are one of, not the, but one of the coldest places in the U.S. during these months between December and April. Yeah. Right? I mean, coldest month, January? January. Snowiest month? March. I remember when I was a younger man, full head of hair. Long time ago. Graduated from the Air Force Academy prep school in May. Yeah. And we had snow. Yeah. That happens. Right. Happens. So, you know, the, the, the reality is we live in a very harsh environment. And the question is, do we stop construction when it gets too cold out? Oh, uh, poor baby. No, <laughs> I, no, I'm sorry. We can't do that. We, we, we do, though. We do, but we shouldn't. I mean, I mean, if you compare this to places colder than the Arctic Circle, I spoke to some gentleman the other night about, ah, it's going to be negative 5 here. And they're like, negative 5? It's going to be negative 57. <laughs> so that, to them, our day was a tropical day that they would be more than happy to pour concrete in. Springtime. Springtime. So um, the... Uh, the question is, what are the practical job sites to use hydronic temperature controlling, specifically hydronic heating, um, because the reality is we can't stop construction. We can't just keep pushing those dates. I mean, we can, but... I mean, you know, that's a practical thing. People got to make a living. I mean, we can't put all the, send all the construction crews home for six months and, you know, they'll be gone the time we need them again. Well, and then we just won't get anything done. Won't get anything done. I mean, you and I were talking about 470, the right. port to pour out on 470. I mean, that goes from I-25 all the way to the foothills. It's about 16, 18 miles. They're putting in toll lanes, they're putting in extra lanes. Uh, they've been at it almost a year. You can't stop. You just can't stop. I go by there almost every Friday, and uh, they have tractor trailer loads of these black uh, insulation blankets. Right. They pour, they insulate. The problem is sometimes when it gets down to negative 15, right. negative 20, insulation blankets, don't cut the cheddar. Yeah, that's right. I mean, from the amateur's viewpoint, I mean, you can't let your mixed water freeze. You can't let your mixed water freeze. From the chemistry standpoint, the more scientific standpoint, you can't stop the activation there. And once you get to a cold enough temperature, you're yanking that energy is coming out of the concrete to the ambient environment. And David's right, you lose that active energy to kick off the thermokinetics of cement hydration. Um, so your hydronic temperature controlling hydronic heating is you sandwiching a water distribution system and you're controlling that water temperature, either heating it during the winter or cooling it during the summer and you're sandwiching it between these insulation blankets. Right. And I think that's mostly for outdoor situations. For indoor situations, a lot of times we see these big propane heaters, these uh, barn heaters, stable heaters, blowing out uh, what they blow out. I mean, it's it's warm, but it's more than warm. So, so again, <laughs> what are the practical measures when doing this controlling of temperature? Should you go propane if you're indoors? Because you could do hydronic if you're indoors too. Yeah. But let's go to Let's go to propane for a second. That just... Propane. And I've seen that a lot. Residential, too. Absolutely. You see that a lot indoors on big, you know, warehouse floors and shopping centers and those kinds of things. Part of the problem with propane is it puts out CO2 as well. It puts out heat, but it puts out gases as well. CO2 is... Terrible. Terrible actor, especially for wet concrete. Right. It combines... In that form. Yeah. The CO2 going in that form is terrible for the concrete. Yeah, I mean, we can get up in the 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 percent CO2 range, right. and um, that causes, combines with the moisture and forms carbonic acid, carbonic acid, 
Not good for concrete. Not good for concrete. Anything acid. Not, not good, good for, for con concrete. Now that being said, you are controlling the temperature by heating up that localized environment. Right. But as is that the most practical measure? Yeah. A lot of people use it, so it must must be partly uh, mostly practical. Just because a lot of people are jumping off a bridge, yeah, doesn't mean they're right. Yeah, I get that. Just, I mean, just to wrap up this video, to use hydronic is a way of controlling the temperature down to a few degrees, right, through the entire life cycle of that freezing period, right. You know, with heat, with using propane heaters, you're definitely controlling the temperature of the area, the localized area, but then you know, to a degree you also could be killing people if you're not ventilating out the CO2. Yeah, there's safety hazards without a doubt. So, I mean, it's like everything. There has to, has to be a balance. I mean, you know, we want to get the concrete cured, but we don't want to hurt it. We don't want people to get sick. I mean, it's like everything in design. There's got to be a balance. So, based off of that balance, you know, before we started this, David and I were talking about different job sites where you could use uh, hydronic temperature controlling. Uh, there was a bridge in Washington, D.C. over the Potomac. Potomac. Yeah, the Potomac. <laughs> Sorry, I had a French boss. Uh, where on the bridge decking they used the hydronic temperature controlling during winter. So my question was, could you use hydronic temperature controlling in dams? Uh, dams would be tough because of, of the volume and the, the big cubes and whatnot. Uh, but then you look at the Hoover and they used hydronic, they used cold water. With the copper tube. That was that was the opposite. They were trying to cool down the sure. heat of hydration. Right, but so, still they're using hydronic. Yeah. So I guess in that case, yeah, you could use you can control high temperatures or low temperatures right. uh, to, to help the situation. I I wanted to know, would it be impractical to do a two or three hundred foot diameter pad for a tank? And as long as you had the system set up beforehand. Yeah, I don't see that as being much different than two or three miles of pavement. I mean, pavement geometry is a little more beneficial right. if you can get to both sides. But um, usually, you know, you screen or do things with pads, so after you screen, you just blanket. So, right. Yeah, yeah see. you could do it, just be a pain in the butt. Yeah. But, but stopping construction. Yeah, working in the cold is a pain in the butt. I mean, it's a pain in the fingers, it's a pain in the ears. It's a pain. It is a pain, but there are ways to pour concrete even when you're below zero, and that's what we wanted to get across. And we hope you learned something today. If you have any questions, any concrete concerns, don't hesitate to ask. But thanks for joining us today. Let us know if you got any concrete questions, concrete concerns. Don't forget to like, subscribe, ding the bell. There it is. <laughs> Go concrete! Be asshole.